everybody. Thanks for joining us again here at Sunnyside today. It's a sunny Sunday here at Sunnyside. You can see by the glare on my head, greenhouse is nice and warm, sun is out, people are hopping, plants are popping. So come on down today, hopefully we'll see you. But uh, today's vine class, uh, climbers, clingers, creepers, kind of all those things into one. We're talking about all things vines. Uh, I'm Trevor, our general manager here. Say hi to Nicole, she's back there in the background. Good morning. And Mr. Smith is in the house uh, doing some chat questions, so make sure you ask him some tough ones. You need to keep him on his toes out there, so, so ask him some hard ones. He's a vine guy much more than me, so ask him about some strange ones. We'll, we'll keep him on his toes. So, uh, to, like I said, we've got vine class. Hopefully everybody got the handout. It's uh, on the internet. We can email it to you. It's on the website. Uh, but it's a you know light reading again, about five. Well, it's only four pages this time, so that's not too bad. That'll give you a nice kind of synopsis on maybe some thoughts before you choose a vine and kind of where to locate them and, and certainly discuss some options. Uh, there's a lot of vines around that we can grow, but I'm going to start this uh, kind of class off by talking a little bit about hardiness. You know, uh, an evergreen vine is a very subtropical type plant. So if you kind of watch Discovery Channel like me and the rest of our little science channels, you're going to see all kinds of evergreen, clingy, fancy, climby. Amazon forest all over the world. Evergreen vine is tough here, you know, when we do have some winter time. So there's very limited options. I know this last winter we had, uh, hearing from our customers, most of the evergreen vines got some damage, especially if they were kind of newly planted in 2021. Um, so just keep that in mind, you know, sometimes evergreen maybe isn't the necessity. We get a nice flowering vine that would be a little hardier, might be a little easier to grow as well. Um, you know, these are plants that all need support, you know, and depending on what you choose, it could be a massive pergola, it could be a trellis, it could be simply a post. Um, you know, for me in my yard, it could be as simple as a little art piece you like, a little obelisk, something metal, something wood. Um, you know, there's a lot of options to kind of go vertical and give you a little bit of height um, by growing vine. But, but like all classes I do here, you know, kind of choosing the right plant for the right place is key. You know, sun, shade, we'll go through all that here in the slideshow. but uh, certainly explore your options before you make a choice um, and can again consider the winter time you know is it going to re be reliably hardy or maybe do I sacrifice the evergreen part of it and get something that might be a little easier to deal with over the winter months. Um, there, we, at the end of this slideshow we will be showing some annual vines you know that's not limited to just a few I'll show you but just to kind of perk the interest you know it's a great way you know again to add a vertical element into a simple annual container planting you know, everybody does petunias and million bells and geraniums and all of our typical annuals. But if we have a nice sized pot, we accent it with some color, you know, nothing's to say we can't put a little obelisk or a little metal, little trellis, you know, in the center, you know, and grow something like black eyed Susan vine on there. That's going to give you a lot of flower power all the way through the summer till we get frost, you know, just like the the name means, you know, nothing is going to give you more color than an annual. We'll talk about a lot of good flowering vines that are hardy, but I'm going to bloom for a couple months, wait a bit, bloom again, or just bloom in a particular season, whereas some of these annual options, you know, may give you the color you want for the entire summer, fall, and it's not the end of the world if we, you know, send it to the compost heap in the sky in the fall and we plant another one in, in 2023, okay? Um, I'm going to start the slideshow here. Give me one second to share my screen. And we'll go through here kind of fast and furious as usual and kind of show you some pictures. And again, hopefully kind of start that thought process. You know, if you're considering, you know, going vertical and adding some height into the garden, this may be some, some things to think about as we go along. You know, so here's a few things to ask yourself right there. You know, how much sun or shade is that plant going to get? You know, there's a lot of shady options. There's a lot of sunny options. Uh, we can certainly do half and half. But again, choosing the right option for your sun location is always going to be kind of phase one. Evergreen deciduous. You know, we, we have a lot of evergreen here, evergreen plants. It's not the end of the world if the vine perhaps is deciduous or perennial. Um, there are some evergreen ones we'll talk about. Um, as well, but that's certainly a question to kind of ponder. You know, is it a particular season? You know, a lot of customers I help, you know, are looking for a pop in the spring, or maybe it's late summer, fall, maybe it's a, a fall color, maybe it's summer bloom, you know, whatever the season is, 
you know, again, we can choose the right plan to kind of to kind of keep your needs as a gardener happy. Um, a big thing with me is, you know, what kind of structure, surface, what kind of room do you have to grow this? You know, I think a lot of people come down and, and grab something like a wisteria vine, for example, and think they can keep it on a little three foot wide by six foot trellis long term. You know, that's a big plant and we want to give some support and room to grow and mature. Then you'll see its, its wonder as it grows on. Um, so again, how much room, what kind of structure, where are you locating it are all going to be key questions. A uh, big one for surface to consider, is it wood? Is it metal? Is it concrete? Um, you know, there's a lot of vines that will, you know, twine and tendril and climb on a structure. There's other ones we have to kind of help attach to it. There's other things that are going to root right into brick, concrete, wood, um, maybe not the best thing on the, the siding of the house, um, but, you know, a brick chimney, uh, maybe it's a concrete wall you're trying to let something grow up on, uh, certainly a wooden fence on the perimeter of the property. You know, those are all options as well of, of some things we'll show you that will root right into those structures. Um, you know, and again, how much coverage do you need? You know, clematis is a great example that we'll go through where you have so many options on size, how big it'll get, when does it bloom. Um, sometimes clematis can get a little overwhelming. There's a lot of choice out there. Um, as far as colors, varieties, and sizes, um, you know, but how much covers do you need? You know, if I just want to fill a little six foot trellis, you know, get a smaller clematis. We don't have to get one that grows to 15 feet that we have to fight pruning on every season. We can get a lot of tidy ones that will just fill a small area. Um, you know, a big one to think about is pruning. You know, are you gonna be up for tipping this back, pruning it back? Do you want something that you can kind of let go a little bit more? Do you have the room to let it go? Um, you know, these are all good questions as well to kind of think about with pruning. Um, and then for me, you know, hummingbirds, butterflies, pollinators, you know, I want to attract some, some fun insects in the yard, you know, and a lot of the vines will get you hummingbird to come visit the flower, a butterfly to come visit the flower, certainly bees uh, to buzz around and kind of pollinate all these things. So, so consider the flower. And if you're trying to attract maybe a particular uh, insect into the yard, we can, we can also help with that as well. You know, if we start out kind of with clematis, you know, you say clematis, I say clematis. We, we won't say it too British-like today, but uh, you can call it whatever you like. My British accent's not too good, so I won't try to go with the clematis, but uh, certainly we would call it that there. Um, you know, there is a massive number of clematis. You know, if you went online uh, to a place like Clearviews up in Vancouver or Canada and looked at the hundreds of choices of clematis, um, it can get overwhelming. You know, we try to keep it simple here. <laughs> and get the best of the best in, you know, a wide range of colors, a few different growth habits, and certainly some that will do more hot sun, more part shade, um, and a few that will do better in shade as well. Um, you know, look at your options because there is a lot of them around. Um, you know, clematis is the one plant probably on the property, I would always say plant deeper than it is in the pot. That's always kind of hard to tell people because I would not do that with a lot of other plants we discuss in these classes. But the, the, we want really good drainage with clematis. And the issue up here, if you struggle with it, if you lose them, it's typically they are too wet, you're overwatering them, and we get clematis wilt. A lot of times that'll start at the crown, you lose all your growth. But if we have that buried down in the soil a little bit, it tends to protect the crown, help a little bit in the wintertime as well. And you may not end up, if you get the wilt, the, 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 the the tendrils will die back, but I still have that crown that's alive that will shoot back up growth and recover. I'll speak from experience for me. You know, I added a new one in my little shade garden last year called Vancouver Star, and it's a good white one. It's a fragrant one, um, but man, I probably watered it a little too much when I put it in thinking it was new and dry, and I got will. I died back to the ground. I said, okay, we'll see what happens, and guess what this spring? I've got brand new growth coming right up because I planted it a little deeper. So, so keep that in mind. Um, as I mentioned, you know, some for sun, some for shade, some for part sun. Look at your labels. Look at the options because they're always going to be real honest. This one's best in morning sun. This one will take all the heat you got. There's going to be options for both. Um, clematis is, you know, drainage is part of it. But the other tip probably for clematis is they love to have hot tops as a general rule, but cool root systems. So this is a tough one sometimes in the garden. We cite one in sun up against the house. Maybe it's reflected heat, but we try to try to do something to try to keep those surface roots 
and that root system cool. Yes, planting it a little deeper will help, but a lot of times a little perennial at the base, even some rock, you know, something to kind of lay over the top that will to absorb that, that sunshine in the summertime and let the soil stay a little bit cool underneath, that will always help as well. That's also kind of part of the container discussion. You know, a lot of clematis are great to grow in pots. I've done it before as well. Um, watch the container, because that's a tough one to put it out in the sun and get a dark black container that gets super warm in the summer. The clematis may not be quite as happy with that. So if we can find those spots, or maybe the pot's a little shady down towards ground level, but we do have some sunshine up above, that would be ideal. You know, most all clematis that we sell here, um, in fact, all of them, but two, are going to be deciduous or perennial. So we would always have something that would turn pretty color in the fall, lose its leaves, keep the wood, and then relief out again the next year. There are a couple evergreen choices we will look at um, here in the slides. Um, if you're talking about feeding them, you know, typically we would want to feed these guys coming out of winter. So, you know, it could go back a month ago if you haven't done it. It's never too late to add some fertilizer. So get some food on it here now. And then maybe one more time in that kind of early summer range. Maybe it's mid-June or so at this point. Um, you know, that's going to get me nice growth. Keep it blooming. Keep it happy. I would always use something organic. I like slow and steady myself. You could certainly put a water-soluble food on a vine if you really want to get it growing fast that first year. Um, but a nice like rose and flower food from E.B. Stone, you know, something easy, granular, can be applied on the surface and watered in. That will keep that clematis plenty happy. Um, last one there you'll see is know your pruning group. And I'm going to guess that uh, some folks are probably asking that in, in mass here. What do I do with this? What do I do with that? How far can I cut this back? You know, if we don't know what your variety is, it's going to be real hard to give you pruning advice. But if you look online, you'll see in the handout, you know, classified, uh, clematis in particular, classified into three different pruning groups. And really all that matters is, does it bloom only on old wood? <coughs> that means I can't cut it back very much or I'm not going to get flowering. Does it bloom on new and old wood, which is a great way to go. And the majority of things we have, the majority of the good clematis, I think, are in that group. Or does it bloom on strictly new growth? And sometimes those would start from the ground every year and literally start over again and bloom a little bit on new growth. Again, for us, I like the, the group with bl blooming on old and new wood because right now we get flower in May, June off last year's growth. Then we grow up like crazy, like vines do. We get fresh growth and all that will set flower buds and bloom for me again in that late July, August, September timeframe. So you'll see that on labels. You'll find that out as you're making your choices, but in, in essence, those are our three options. Now, if we look through some clematis, you know, first one's an evergreen one here, clematis armandii. You know, these are done blooming already, believe it or not. This is one that blooms out uh, typically through maybe late February on some years, but through March and April. It's got great fragrance, it's white, or we can do apple blossom, which would have a light pink in it as well. Um, you know, this is a big plant. You know, you can see by that picture, I know my mother had one at our last house uh, growing up for years that covered quite a substantial area around the garage. So this is something I would need to support. I can run it on a fence. I can grow it really anywhere, um, but it would be evergreen. Give me spring bloom, but nothing for flower in the summer, fall, just the foliage after that. I think these do much better in part sun, part shade. They certainly can handle afternoon sun if you water them a bit, but I think if you want that lush foliage and a happier plant, the morning sun uh, to part shade situation would be ideal. You know, I get probably 50-50 on this. I've asked a lot of customers I know have these this last winter. Yes, some people had severe dieback on these, probably not death, but they had to be pruned back to let them kind of get going again. Um, this is one that we would be right in that zone seven range. So we start dipping down into the teens or single digits. Uh, perhaps there's certainly some tip dieback or foliage damage on some of these, but they'll tend to come, come right back out from spring. The other option would be something like the avalanche or Car Cartmanii clematis. These are evergreen. They've got a cute little cut leaf on them, which is nice. Much more manageable for size. This would be, to me, a great choice uh, for an early spring, spring bloomer 
uh, to have in a container. This would be a great choice for that if you want to get a little verticality out of it or to grow on a smaller space, maybe just a post, um, a little small trellis, uh, something that we can keep maintained a little better. Uh, that would be a better way to go. Um, this is one we do have just a couple left. We'll hopefully get some more of these in. But this one, again, is just getting towards the, the tail end of its bloom. If we look at some species clematis, we have a few of these left right now. The alpina is, you know, kind of one that would be native more to European regions, certainly super cold hardy. That's not the issue. We would kind of get those little nodding flowers, which are awful pretty, a lot of times blues, which is a fun color. Uh, and this one is in bloom right now. This would be one that just blooms on old wood and would be blooming here in that April, May, maybe the early June time frame. Uh, so our plants did have a little bit of flowering on them right now. Um, and certainly one you, you know, you won't find a lot of places. There are some color options, um, but certainly a species um, may be worth considering. These are the old orange peel clematis. Uh, we're trying to find some more of these for this year. This one's a little harder to come by. Um, this one's probably got one of the prettier seed heads. If you look in that picture there, you'll kind of see that that fun little spiky seed head going. So we get those little nodding flowers again that are that bright golden yellow orange color. And we have those seed heads that are developed afterwards. This is another one uh, that blooms a little bit earlier and it's blooming on old wood. This is not one we would want to be able to prune back uh, very far. This would limit our pruning a little bit, uh, but certainly one that's great for naturalizing and, and maybe covering a little bigger area. Then we have this, the sweet autumn clematis, we call this. This one has been changed its species a couple times over my lifetime, but essentially this is one that we would have nice growth spring and fall. These will kick into bloom with white fragrant flowers, August, September, as we get to late summer into the early fall time. Uh, this is a large grower. You know, this is one we would want to give some room and a pretty good structure to grow on. I've seen some pretty substantial uh, sweet autumn clematis. This is one some folks even have necessarily grown up into a tree, you know, and kind of let it grow up into a deciduous or evergreen tree uh, as, as its substrate as well. This one will get gets up pretty big. Um, it does tend to seed itself a little bit, so be careful, you know, maybe where it's located um, and watch for the spread a little bit. Then we have Clematis Montana. You know, this is the quintessential spring blooming Clematis. A lot of times, again, a little bit of light fragrance is nice. We can do whites, different shades of pink. Uh, these are one that get great fall color. That's probably the, one of the best bonuses of, of the Montana group. A little bigger growers. Again, great for growing up even large trees or large structures. Great spring bloom, nice clean foliage, and excellent fall color. This is one we'll get a little better fall, fall color on. You know, these are pretty hardy. This is one uh, that will live in a little bit of colder climates. Um, and again, blooming on old wood. This is not one that we would cut back a massive amount over the winter. We can trim it up. We can clean it out. We can do some, some tidying on it, but we're not going to cut it back and let it start over again. Yes, it will grow, but I'm going to sacrifice almost all my flower if I cut it back real hard. Now, if we get into, you know, kind of the hybrid clematis, excuse me. You know, again, hundreds and hundreds of options out there. So I tried to pick a few, maybe show you a different range of them. Um, I think probably on the newer side, the Vancouver series uh, is a great kind of local one, just north, our Canadian brothers in, on the north border here, not too far. Um, this is a great series, I think, for tidier growers, big flowers, bold plants. But most of this stuff is going to be in the five, six, seven, eight foot range, something I can grow in a container, on a small trellis, a post, and not have to get it so large. These are all ones that would be blooming again now and repeating again late summer. So there's more of these coming out, it seems, every year. We've got three or four in so far. We'll have others trickle in here through the season. But here's just a couple of them to kind of show you. You know, Starry Nights, you know, big, huge flower. You can see the bar color on there with the nice two-tone bloom. That's the one I added for the shade, Fragrance Star. I wanted a little light fragrance. Didn't mind the white, you know, kind of it's back in the shade, tends to pop a little bit more. That's another option. If you like the dark purple, we just got a bunch of Danielle in. Um, that's a nice dark one, big flower again. Um, and Mystic Jam will kind of give me the two-tone pink look. That picture there is a little bit bleached out. 
It'll be a little darker pink than that when you see it bloom. Um, but another one, I'm going to have kind of the bar colors on there, really attractive stamens in the middle, and a nice looking large size bloom as we, as we go through the season. You know, Boulevard is another series. Uh, we got the first couple in just this last week. We'll have more of these coming in uh, through May. Now that we finally have some sunshine in spring, they're starting to grow. Um, the Boulevard series, series was made for that. Small container grown clematis, again, small trellises. These are all plants that we would stay um, really under six feet tall in a season. So things we can keep in a small area in the yard. Some for sun, some for shade, nothing changes. But I might look real hard at some of the Boulevard series. Uh, we'll probably have eight or 10 different colors in as the season goes on. We have a couple so far, um, but this will give you a little kind of taste. All the colors in the world, you know, different, different two-tone ones, blues, purples, whites. We can still do all the, the same color range but just have a little bit smaller plant. We've got poly. Some people call that little duckling, I think was the other name of it. Got some blue, got some, you know, more lavender. Sarah Elizabeth's a beautiful pink. Uh, I think we've got a, a purplish one in back there right now. So maybe look at that as, a, again, another option uh, for a smaller type perennial clematis. Samaritan Joe, Yuan, we'll have both those in here pretty quick as well. If we go to kind of classic, you know, hybrids, things that maybe been around for quite a while, um, you know, and certainly have their spots in the garden, but maybe grow a little bigger. Maybe I want to cover a larger area. Some of these would be great choices for you, depending on your color, your color preference. You know, Nellie Mosier is still, you know, we have Nellie in every year for probably 30 years I've done this, and we have Nellie in right now. You know, that's still a great classic large pink with that beautiful bar color on it. Uh, that's one I'd certainly look at if you like the pink tones. Uh, Multi-blue is a real fun one if you like kind of the double center look. Um, that's a great way to introduce a little blue color to the garden uh, and vertic verticality again. Uh, Multi-blue is one we have in as well. I don't have any whites in yet, so we'll have some whites here pretty quick. Um, but we have lots of options for whites. You know, Old Henry, I, Toki, Candida. Uh, we'll have some whites here pretty good. And white is one of those ones, again, maybe a little more suited to the shade or part shade area. That white flower tends to glow a little bit if you've got a little darker spot in the garden. Uh, lots of red options. You know, Ernest Markham is one, uh, but we've got others out there as well. And then lots of purples and pinks and everything in between. So, you know, Jackman Eye, again, is a classic old-fashioned purple. That gets huge. You know, I think I've seen, you know, Jackman Eye covering a, you know, 20, 25 foot fence before, if you got the time to let it grow, that'll be a nice big, big one for you. Uh, we have some Killian Donahue in, and if you like that reddish pink with the lighter pink, kind of that two-tone flowers, real pretty. Iobi is a real deep burgundy red. Ramona is a nice blue. You know, the point is all these hybrids, um, much easier to prune because we talked again about the beginning it, these bloom on old wood and new wood, so I can cut it way back if I want, maybe sacrifice the early bloom, but still have all kinds of color in the summer. I can leave some wood. You know, typically we would leave at least three feet of these out of the ground if we're going to prune in early spring, and I will have some old wood bloom. And again, all that new growth is going to continue to flower over the summer. Now, if we look at kind of phase two here, is honeysuckle time. You know, now we kind of introduce probably a little more reliable fragrance. I'll turn around here because I brought one in. And I'll just smell it real quick. If I can reach it. You know, there are some nice honeysuckle. Yeah, that one smells delicious. The whole room here smells because I got honeysuckle and some jasmine in here. But uh, honeysuckle is one uh, that we would probably get a little bolder color. You know, we can get into our oranges, reds, pinky, yellow, white. A lot of options for honeysuckle typically going to have at least some light fragrance. Some of them are extremely fragrant. Um, these are ones that are going to like sun. You know, the one issue probably with me with honeysuckle and shade is a little bit of mildew. We want to make sure we get good sun on, on honeysuckles, and you're probably going to have a, a much happier plant with a little bit of cleaner foliage. You know, these are ones that are perfect for attracting hummingbirds. You know, hummingbirds, butterflies, pollinators, honeysuckles will get you some action on that as we go through the go through the blooming season here. Um, give them a little room to grow. You know, honeysuckles a plant in different areas of the country. A lot of times they'll plant it, let it grow over rockeries and spread as a ground cover. 
you know, I don't see that very much up here, but that's certainly something that can that can be done. Typically, these need a structure. This is not one that's going to twine itself and attach into anything. We need to tie it up onto a post, attach it to a trellis, get it up onto an arbor. It'll find its way once it starts growing, but we need to give it a little structure to, to keep it up and, and keep it happy. Um, you know, honeysuckles are all going to be deciduous. Yes, there is a evergreen species of honeysuckle. Yes, we get it in once in a while. You know, again, I don't think it has nearly the showy or bloom. And again, we take a little more risk in the wintertime um, of some dieback or, or death of plant. So for us, it's really a lot of the deciduous or perennial type honeysuckles. We've got quite a bit in now and we've got a whole bunch more coming this week. So this is probably prime time for honeysuckle selection here. If you're in the mood to, to add a little fragrance and something to keep the hummingbird happy. Um, this is one that blooms on old wood. So we don't want to cut honeysuckle back a huge amount thinning it out, tidying up, that's absolutely perfect. Um, we can cut it back a bit, but we're not gonna cut it way back or we're probably gonna sacrifice a little bit of our flowering for the season or certainly delay it till later, um, later on in the season as well. So if you look at a few, you know, I just pulled the gold flame was the one I pulled up here by my nose to smell. Uh, Hall's honeysuckle by far, I think is the most fragrant. White, yellow flower, a big aggressive grower, that'll cover some area. Um, that's a plant that'll knock your socks off for smell as well. Gold Flame's got a great pleasing fragrance, uh, more on the pink to yellow tones on that one. And then we've got the classic hummingbird look. You know, we want to go orangey red. We look at things like Mandarin, Major Wheeler. We've got Drop More Scarlet. A lot of these old classic honeysuckles would give me the real hot colors. Maybe not as heavy on the fragrance, to be honest with you, but a really short, really sharp, a bright bloom as those come into flower here during the season. Now, if we kind of go to the next one here, this is Akibia, which is always fun to say. I don't know why I like that word, Akibia, it just kind of sounds fun. Uh, we call this the chocolate vine. So no, it doesn't produce chocolate bars, it's a different plant, but it kind of smells a little like chocolate. These white flowers are coming out right now. These are blooming in spring. It gets a real attractive little fruit on it. You know, if you let them get old, they get a fun little fruit on there after the bloom. But the white one in particular uh, is the one we would sell. We tend to stay away from the purples and things. They're a little more mildew prone. But white has been a great plant here. We've got a huge specimen on the nursery property. Steve planted years and years ago in a planter box. We'd be happy to show you. Um, this is typically something I would say would be evergreen. Keep most of its leaves in the winter. You know, this is about as bad as winter as we get. And yes, ours defoliated a little bit. Doesn't hurt the plant, doesn't kill any wood. We dropped some leaves, you know, kind of after the holidays and it went kind of half dormant. It's already leafing back out. It's already grown three feet. And it's coming into full bloom right now. So this is one of you, like a kibia, uh, come visit ours at the nursery. We'll show you the big one we have. And because we have one here, we always keep a bunch of these around. We've got plenty of a kibia vine. Uh, it is fragrant. It does just bloom in spring, but you do have some nice foliage to uh, to utilize the rest of the season. Now, this is a big plant. You know, we cut ours back, uh, if not twice a year, sometimes three times a year to kind of keep it on a 12 foot or so area that we have it growing. Uh, this is one, if I was trying to cover a huge long fence line, a chain link fence, a wood fence, or a big area, this might be a good option for you because this will put on uh, some serious growth. I would guess probably six feet plus a year in vine growth. This is going to take off pretty quickly. So this may be a great option. We've had a lot of customers over the years purchase these, you know, plant one every eight feet on their chain link fence to kind of hide the neighbor a little bit and just let it take over. You know, this is one that will cling and twine and find its own way. You don't need to attach this one uh, onto much. This is one that will find the crack, the crevice, the chain link, attach itself and then off it goes, okay? Uh, wisteria, you know, I brought a couple in here. They're not quite blooming yet. They're just starting to bud out here, here in May. We were a little bit late this year with the cold weather. Um, but this is the, the big, this is the biggest flower we'll probably talk about today. You know, wisteria is a big plant, a big plant. It's a big flower. It is probably the most impressive vine when it's flowering. Um, and you've got a lot of options again, Chinese wisteria, Japanese wisteria, American wisteria, silky wisteria. Uh, we tend to keep a little bit of all of them around. 
but you're going to pick your color, you know, typically on these whites, pinks, blues, lavenders, purples. Uh, we can pick some double ones. We can pick single ones. Uh, they're all going to smell incredible. So yes, maybe a couple a little more powerful than others. My nose can't tell them apart, you know, to that extent, but they're all going to be super fragrant when they flower. Got usually April, May, maybe into early June. And a lot of these tend to kind of throw a random flower out here and there later in the summer, fall. You know, I can't promise you that one's going to repeat bloom, but a lot of these I've seen will tend to flower a little bit again a second time in the season. So this is a big plant. You know, I want to make this perfectly clear. Um, I think I've seen pictures of wisteria in Japan uh, trained as trees up 60, 70 feet tall. So this is not a plant we're going to put by our front door. It's not a plant we're going to keep on a little, you know, post. It's not a plant we're going to put on a three foot by six foot trellis. This is a plant we need to give room to grow, mature, so that it can show its stuff. I mean, it is probably, again, the most impressive of the vines, but give it somewhere to grow, a big pergola, a big arbor, you know, something that you can let it grow and, again, mature. Full sun is always best with these, and really the only reason we would struggle with wisteria is going to be drainage. If we have clay or a little too wet in the winter, that would be the one problem with wisteria. Just make sure we've got a nice sunny location and excellent drainage, and you're probably going to have more wisteria than you want. This is one that gets uh, gets pretty big. You know, for us at Sunnyside, you know, I can't speak for other nurseries, but uh, we're pretty, I'm pretty particular about wisteria that we carry. You know, these are all what we would call color verified. A lot of times you'll buy wisteria, it's grafted, it's small. You may not see a flower for five, six, seven years. You know, we try to get older plants in here. Yes, they're a little more expensive, but they've been flower color verified. And I will estimate every one of these plants are gonna throw down 20, 25, 30 flowers in the next month. So, I mean, I'm into instant gratification a little bit with some of this, and that would be one you're gonna get some instant gratification. Uh, I'll tell you this, do not wait if you want a wisteria. I'd get yourself down here this weekend or in the next week or so, because once they're gone, they are gone. This is not a plant. I can make a phone call and get a new purple one for you next week kind of thing. We, we ordered these six, eight months ago. We got our 100, 150 plants in here a week ago, and when they're gone, they are gone. So uh, a lot of people have left their name from last year and already claimed them. So come down soon to grab one. There's some very nice plants out there. They are just starting to swell flower buds right now. Uh, you'll see what I mean. Now, the last thing on there I wanted to mention, because we get a lot of phone calls, emails. Do you have wisteria trees? You know, there isn't some mythical creature that's a wisteria tree. It's how it's trained and pruned. So you could take these back home, the ones we have right now. They look more like trees than they do vines. And by properly pruning them, supporting them until they get older wood, you could turn one of these into a pretty cool wisteria tree. Um, it's a fun way to kind of grow them and you could have them out in the yard with age and some training. Yes, I could have it look like a really cool tree with the weeping flowers and the fragrance and all that. But I just wanted to bring it up because there is no different plant that's a wisteria tree. It's still the same plant. It's a matter on you whipping out your snippers and telling it to behave and, and keep it in a tree in a tree shape, okay? So if we look at a few here, um, you know, Coochie Benny, a lot of these will have kind of Japanese names and American names or Chinese names and American names. So you'll kind of, if you look these up on the internet, you're probably gonna find it with maybe two or three names sometimes, but it's still the same, the same wisteria. So you can just kind of look at some color options here, you know, Coochie Benny, Lawrence, Longissima, which some people, the Japanese call that Shironoda. That's a big, huge white one. You know, that's a flower that might be two feet long, you know, when it's hanging in, in, in full glory. You know, Hone Benny's one we call pink ice. You know, if you like a little pinkier flower, that's a great option. We got lots of purples. You know, that's probably the one color we get asked for more than anything else here at Sunnyside is what are my options for purple? Royal purple, the double purple, Violacea plana. That's a fun one if you like a little different flower. Black dragon. You know, we could go on and on. There's a lot of good purplish, you know, kind of options out there. Now, if we kind of dive into 
maybe some little more obscure vines that are kind of fun to grow. You know, I brought a Hobelia's in here behind me. I'll show you when I'm done talking if you like. Um, but Holobelia, we call a sausage vine. You know, this is a an evergreen vine. This one has to be in shade. We're not going to put this out in any afternoon sun. This is one that will grow vigorously. <clears throat> it covers some big area, but I definitely want it in a sheltered woodland garden spot, morning sun only. I don't want a lot of afternoon sun on these at all. They'll get a little tired in the summertime. They grow fast. They're in bloom right now, and this does have a, a great delicious fragrance to it. They call it sausage vine because it does get a really cool fruit on it that looks like a little dangling sausage link once you get a little bit older. Um, so this is a plant that is zone seven, zone eight. You know, we talked about at the beginning, a cold winter, maybe it doesn't treat some of these so well. Um, this one in a sheltered spot should be okay, but I'm just warning you, this is one of those uh, kind of plants that yes, it's gonna depend on the winter a little bit. We might have a little dieback, we might have some foliage damage, um, but certainly something I think will always come back up off the old wood or the root system um, as long as we've got good drainage. So again, shady, great fragrance, evergreen, but maybe be a little cautious on uh, where you kind of locate them and, and watch the wintertime temperatures. This is another one that kind of blooms on old wood. So if we're going to prune, it's going to be after bloom if we want to knock this one down a little bit. You know, climbing hydrangeas is one, you know, I have the Miranda um, at my house. Um, there's some great climbing hydrangeas out there to try. On the left there, we have hydrangea anomala. That's just green leaf, big white lace cap flower. No, it doesn't turn blue. No, it doesn't turn pink. It's always white. It's not like our shrub hydrangeas. So that is one you can see. I took these pictures intentionally to look at brick because these are vines that will root right into a substrate. So be real careful on the house siting where you locate them because if you don't tell these to behave and tame them a little bit, this is gonna grab and cling to whatever it can reach to. So I have one in my yard up on a vertical uh, art piece, a big old rusted kind of obelisk about seven feet tall. So I let mine grow into that, I let it pop out. It's a great little character plant. I love the variegated leaves on the Miranda. I get the nice flower here in May, but I watch it a couple times a year. And when you try to head two feet away and attach yourself to my house, that's not going to happen. I don't want to replace the siding on my house or end up ripping hydrangea roots off my siding and have to repaint. I want to keep the maintenance down a little bit at the, the Cameron homestead, if we'll call it that. So, so keep it on a trellis, you know, a, a little away from siding. But again, You've got a wood arbor, you've got a brick wall, you've got a concrete wall. This would be a great choice that would root right into that and make a total 100% coverage um, as that develops with age. These are both deciduous, so I don't have any leaves in the winter. I've got great summer, fall, summer to fall foliage, nice fall color, but they do have really cool bark. You know, this is one of those plants, If even if it was dormant, I still think it looks cool. It's got peely bark, it's got interesting texture. So don't be afraid of it because it's not evergreen. It's a great, really hardy choice to use. Um, again, for those sunny spots, in the case of the green one, if you like the variegated one, the Miranda, the Firefly, some people call it, I would try to keep that one in a little bit of afternoon shade if you can. You're gonna have nicer looking leaves. That to me would be the option to use in a shade, morning sun uh, type situation. So here's the evergreen side of this. And I almost deleted this slide because this is a tough one to bring up. Um, there's evergreen climbing hydrangeas. You know, again, I'll mention the Whistling Gardener, Mr. Smith. He's there probably answering questions right now. You know, we have a beautiful hydrangea Samanii. He planted years ago and it is growing up our 40 foot flowering cherry out in front of his old house here at the property. You can come look at it. It looks really cool. Again, it rooted right into the bark of the tree. They've got a little symbiosis going. One is not hurting the other. It's not the end of the world. Um, his did not get much foliage damage this winter. I kind of kept an eye on it. Yes, a little bit of dieback here and there. But these are two that, again, I would be real cautious of in the wintertime, depending on where you plant them. They would much rather be in shade. We don't want to plant these out in afternoon sun. We want morning sun only or shade or filtered light like we have at the nursery here up in the tree, sun comes through here and there, but it's not cooking, 
you know, on a south or west type exposure. Both have white flowers. Both are really pretty plants. The Samanii would have a little bigger leaf. It's agrifolia, a little bit narrower foliage. But again, watch the winter time. Be real careful. The other caveat we'll put onto this is these both are really hard to find. I mean, I'm going to be brutally honest. It's really tough for us to find these plants. These are not grown by a lot of places. We get whatever we can. I can tell you right now, if you want one of these, I don't think you're going to see Integrifolia this year. I'll keep watching for it. I have 20 Hydrangea Samanii coming in in about two weeks, and that's all I can promise. You know, we were able to secure those last year. We'll have a nice batch if you want that plant. And it is pretty cool if you like evergreen vines and shade. Email us, leave your number, get you on the wish list, because I can promise you we'll have 20 and probably within 10 days we have zero. So this is not something to come down in early July and say, ooh, I really enjoyed Trevor's Vine Talk in, in uh, late April. Can I have a hydrangea evergreen? It's, it's not going to happen. So try to get in here early or, frankly, reserve one, and we'll make sure hopefully not more than 20 people call or we'll have to go to the, the timestamp thing and see who claimed it first. Now, if we look at Japanese climbing hydrangea, you know, this is a little different plant. It's still kind of in the hydrangea fam family, but this one always makes me smile. It sounds like I'm going out to the mental hospital. This is schizophragma, which is always a fun Latin name to say. Just sounds like I've got some kind of mental issue going, which of course I do, but that's a different story. So schizophragma is a Japanese style climbing hydrangea. Same, similar discussion. These are deciduous, not evergreen. I can get pink flower on some of these, whites on others. There's some great new ones that have some cool leaf color as well. You've got Red Rhapsody right there that would give me some red, some purple on the new growth. Moonlight is on the brick there, same as the American hydrangea, clinging to the brick and naturalizing. Uh, that would give me some silver white variegated leaves. Uh, both are great vines, but again, more for shade, morning sun, and they will cling to structures. If you were down here, we're happy to show you. Again, Steve likes his vines. So if we go to the, the, the fence outside the house here on the property, we can show you old established Japanese climbing hydrangeas that have rooted right into the cedar fence, make a beautiful presentation there in the shade garden. Again, cool bark. I can live without the leaves in the winter. It's certainly a worthwhile plant and being deciduous much, much hardier as well. Oh, excuse me, more water, it's getting warm in here. So we'll get the last couple kind of odds and ends here and we'll do some questions, but you know, we have a specific rose class. The next one's coming up here late May. We'll talk about that here in a minute, but you know, I can't do a vine class without mentioning climbing roses. You know, that's certainly an option uh, for some gardeners. Um, you know, the rose is as simple as this. You're not going to find something that's going to bloom from mid-late May all the way till frost, grown in sun, by a rose. I mean, that's as simple as that. There is no other plant that I'm going to show you today that's going to have seven months of flower power in the sunshine than a climbing rose. So if I'm going for fragrance, long season of bloom, a particular color, look at your climbing rose options. Yes, these don't cling. This is not a plant that's going to wind and attach itself anywhere. I need to have an arbor, a post, some sort of structure that I can attach it to. But climbing roses, depending on your variety, are going to give you some really nice heights and good verticality in the garden for a sunny location. I can put them on brick. I can put them on the south side of my house. I can train it on an arbor, a pergola, anywhere you like. But we want to start it out, let it train up, and cover that area um, as it matures. So, I mean, a typical climbing rose, you know, you probably get – 8, 10, 12 feet or more, depending on the variety, out of growth as it develops wood. Um, so consider some climbing rose options. Again, if you want all summer flower, that's going to be at the top of the list uh, with the benefit of the fragrance. There's a few other ones kind of to give you your colors. You know, I could go white, yellow, you know, orangey, variegated, pink, purple, red. You can pick any color, just like rose bushes. Um, we can find a rose uh, for your taste and your color that has a specific fragrance that would be a great climber. Most of the stuff here, I hate to say, I don't know what it is with climbing roses. We got more than we ever have again this year. 
We are really down. I'm trying to find some more. We always grow our own here. Uh, we will have some other kind of grown by somebody else trickle in here, I'm hoping later in May and June. Um, but again, keep this spot in mind and, and shop for roses early. You know, we always have at least 250, 300 climbing roses around in January when we plant these. I'm probably down to 50 plants right now and I don't have a huge selection anymore because they've been so popular again this year for some reason. So, so keep in mind, you can add it later. You know, we can, we'll get these all again and even more next year. Um, but also think of Austin roses. You know, I never put David Austin roses in this climbing rose discussion, but if you went and visited David Austin rose, you know, the old English, English rose guy, um, you know, he's got fancy roses with all kinds of fun fragrances, you know, myrrh and frankincense and, you know, apple with the hint of pear, you know, all these fun little fragrances. But you can look at Austin roses, all of them will ramble or climb. He has some certainly noted as specifically doing that. But if I don't prune my Austin rose back, I attach it to something, you know, I can get an Austin rose to easily climb over a little walkthrough arbor or a little gate, you know, or something that will give me that intoxicating fragrance. And again, summer bloom all the way through summer and, until fall and, 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 and frost. Now, a few other kind of fun ones, you know, passion vine, it's not a mythical creature. These really do exist. I haven't seen one for a while. These have been really hard to come by the last couple of years. We do have some coming in. I usually don't promise, but I know we will have some, and it will be a couple of weeks still. Um, but this is one that needs heat. You know, passion vine is a total tropical plant. You know, there's no red, purple, anything you're going to get to live here reliably. Typically, it's just the blue crown or a derivative of this one. You can see by that picture, I mean, there's nothing probably cooler than a passion flower vine. If you're able to grow these successfully, this is a pretty sweet flower. I looks like a painting right there if you look at that picture. Um, but I want sun, I want good drainage, and I have to watch the winter time. Yes, if we get a cold winter, these are probably going to die to the ground, but should be root hardy and up we come again. If you've got passion vine, I would doubt it's done anything yet. We have not had any amount of heat or amount of sun to get these woken up. It's usually later April or so. This year is probably going to be more like early mid-May. So we want to have good sun um, to allow these guys to kind of heat up and go. Now uh, here's the jasmine. I've got one back here that I can smell a little bit. Um, this is another one of those evergreen plants. You know, we all live somewhere hopefully in some of your different parts of the country but you know we take seattle to marysville here you know i drive all over and i see people with all-star jasmine you should feel fortunate if you have an old one because i wish i did um and they found a spot they like you know this is a plant that loves heat you couldn't give it enough facing south on brick all the rest it'll take all the heat you got it's the winter time that we worry about with these and this winter Probably didn't treat some star jasmine very well. At least died back a little bit. Maybe had to get pruned back hard to get going again. Um, you know, we get a lot of these in and we saw a lot of them, you know, and I hope people get them into a kind of that sunny sheltered spot that maybe doesn't get as much of the cold winter winds. So they're able to maybe keep these alive in the winter. Maybe it's something you grow in a pot. You know, that's what my mother does. You know, bless her heart. She's got a couple of them in containers that she's able to grow, enjoy the fragrant flowers, the attractive plant, but then throw them in. She's lucky she has a greenhouse. It's not heated too bad, but she can throw those in there in the winter, pop them right back out on the deck the next spring. I think one of her star jasmines, if you're listening, mom, you should have probably replaced it years ago. It's old and tired, but she does keep them. I bet you one of those is going on about 20 years old now. I've seen, seen down in her deck. <clears throat> you know, this is a plant we always get them staked. You know, we go through a couple hundred of these in the spring and summer, but we'll get them staked up. This is a plan if we were down in Georgia, you know, the Southeast, you might see this as a ground cover. You know, this is a plant a lot of people just grow as a shrub and let it just sprawl over the ground and cover some large areas. So you could kind of do either. I think easier up here is to grow it as a vine. Again, attach it to something in full sun so you can see the flower, get the verticality, and enjoy that fragrance too, because these do have a really nice pleasing fragrance. Now trumpet vine, we just got a couple in. This is not one we usually have till 
it gets warm, but we found somebody, they actually have leaves on them. So I do have a trumpet vine out there right now for sale. You know, this is a big plant. You know, this is probably the biggest thing of anything we talked about. I'd, I'd like to see trumpet vine and wisteria go to battle one of these days, put them together and see who wins. Because those are probably the two that uh, like to take over the most amount of space. Um, I've seen trumpet vine covering a farm fence, you know, 100 feet long with age. So this is a plant we can plant in, grows very rapidly in the heat. It gives you the hottest colors for the hummingbirds. I mean, this is probably the favorite vine of the hummingbirds and the pollinators. We've got hot red, we have hot yellow, and we have hot orange. Those are your three choices uh, kind of for trumpet vine. We want sun and we want a big area to grow these on. Make sure you've got room for trumpet vine. This is one you'll either have to cut back a huge amount every year to keep it confined or let it kind of go and do its thing and take over the back 40, a big house wall or something, because that is a, a pretty large plant. This is one up here. We would typically not see flower on until we are warm. Um, some years, not until August, September. Maybe if we have a summer like we did last year, I saw them blooming in July. So we would see that more in the mid to late summer when we do have the hotter days. You know, this is a plant, you know, I'm always honest with people. Be really careful with trumpet vine. I, I hate to use the word invasive, but if you've had trumpet vine, you're, you're probably shaking your head at the screen while you're watching me here going, yeah, I put one of those in and man, it popped up off the roots and really took over a big area. That's good for some people, maybe not so much for others. So just kind of keep that in mind as you, again, you make your choice for your own yard. We look at Boston Ivies. Might make it, Nicole, I got nine minutes here. We look at Boston Ivies. You know, this is kind of a fun one if you kind of think back east. These are super cold hardy. They're deciduous, exquisite fall color. You know, this is a plant that I want to cover a wall super thick, and I want fall color. You're not going to beat Boston Ivy. If you kind of in our neck of the woods, you know, drive across I-90, you know, from Seattle across Mercer Island to the east side over there, and you will see Boston Ivies, Virginia Creepers, all those plants growing on the freeway wall. They're spectacular. You know, they keep the heat down. They cover up the concrete, make it much prettier than looking at concrete. But when they turn color in the fall, they're absolutely beautiful. And that is one, again, like the hydrangeas that would root right into wood, concrete, all these different structures as an option if you want to cover up a big area. So this is one we don't have any quite yet. There will be the first few of them here in a week or so. But you've got some options, you know, big leaf, small leaf. I want more red in the fall. I like my yellow in the fall. If you're a baseball fan, we even get one called Fenway Park. And you can probably guess where that one came from. That's your ivy wall growing at Fenway Park in Boston. So I'm still waiting for the Chicago Cubs Wrigley, Wrigley Field ivy to, to make its way out. But uh, we do have Fenway Park ivy for the Boston, Boston Red Sox fans. So, so watch it as it grows. It is, again, a bigger plant. And another one, you know, we had our family had a place east of the mountains in Clay Ellen for years. I planted Virginia creeper, which is a relative of this beautiful fall color. We use it as a ground cover. We put it on banks and let it take over and sprawl, keep the weeds down. And it was super hardy and got some beautiful fall color as well. Now, a couple of edible things, you know, don't forget about grapes. You know, grapes are a vine. They don't have to all be ornamental. You know, if I want to eat my vine too, I'm going to look at some grapes and I'm going to look at some kiwi. So grapes, we've got a pretty good selection still if you want to eat your vine and have a little edible one. Us for us here, sorry, we don't make much wine here at Sunnyside, so we don't have a lot of wine grapes, but we do a lot of table grapes. So seedless, slip skin, blues, purples, reds, greens, we've got pretty much every color still. But this would be a way, again, I could train a, a pretty great vine up. They have beautiful leaves on them, nice fall color, but I would also get to pick some fruit. Uh, kiwi is another one. Just got a bunch more kiwi in. We've now got self-fertile, hardy kiwi and fuzzy kiwi. If you like your store, you know, tropical kiwi, we don't have to buy a he and a she anymore. We got one plant that would have both on them. And <laughs> excuse me, you can see by that picture, you know, kiwi is a big plant. You know, grape, I can cut back a bit. You've probably driven by a winery and see them nicely pruned in rows. You know, I can keep a grape maybe contained a little bit more. 
The kiwi is going to be a big plant, so we need to prune it annually to keep it down a little bit, but give it some room to grow. You know, they love sun. They'd love to take over a nice area. Um, and again, I think it's a pretty plant, big tropical looking uh, fuzzy leaves on fuzzy kiwi. And again, it's always nice to have a little fruit. Kiwi's delicious. And as you mature a couple of years in the ground, you start to develop the flower and get the fruit on it. You'll have your own supply of fresh kiwi you can have every late summer fall. You know, hops we'll have here pretty quick. Uh, we don't brew here at Sunnyside, but you can. we have a lot of home brewers that like to plant their own hops. Uh, golden hops we have on the property here again. Mr. Smith loves his vines, so we can show you our golden hops. It kind of covers an archway going into the garden in the shade. Um, that's a beautiful plant for foliage. It's super aggressive, and you'll get a lot of it. Uh, but that's one, if you like yellow, golden hops is a, a, is a beautiful plant to grow, you know, like we have it on a shady kind of entry, a gate arbor. Uh, something for a little bit of interest. On the right there is going to be our beer, you know, whether it's Cascade hops or this hops or that hops, you know, some will be for flavor, some will be for structure. You know, again, we're not here to make beer, but it's a pretty viney plant anyway with, with an interesting flower there, um, but we certainly would have some of the, the beer making hops in here pretty quick as well. And then lastly, just a couple of annual vines. You know, at the beginning I mentioned you know, flower power. Yes, the rose is going to bloom all summer. Maybe I don't have a place I want a climbing rose. Yes, I get a long season out of clematis. You know, maybe I don't have room and I want to do clematis. Maybe it's just, you know, a nice size container. I put some annuals in it. I put an obelisk in the middle and I get a black eyed Susan vine or a rotokite or something annual. And that's by trait what it is. An annual vine is going to be all about flower power. If I feed this regularly, you know, with something like our Seagro, a water soluble food, it's going to grow like a weed and it's going to bloom like crazy. So maybe it's just a you know little trellis underneath the kitchen window, <clears throat> you know, on a hot sunny spot that I want the color all summer. Maybe it's even trailing, you know, out of a little window box or something by the kitchen window. Maybe it's a little the container in an art piece, like I mentioned. You know, these would all be, I think, inexpensive options to add something in there as an annual and get you superior flower power all the way through till we get frost. The last one there, another annual is Mandevilla. So this is the week for Mandevilla. Um, this is a plant from Chile, they call it Chilean jasmine. Not a chance you're gonna get this to live through the winter. I wanna make that, through, that clear, but we go through a lot of Mandevilla here for these reasons uh, that I just talked about. Maximum flower power in the summer, a beautiful leaf, bright colors, Great for the pollinators, the hummingbirds, butterflies, all the other goodies. But this would be one that would give you a really nice annual option. Whites, pinks, and hot red colors. We'll have all three uh, about midweek next week. We'll finally be Mandevilla time. We'll have a whole bunch of them ready to go. So there again, as usual, is our, you know, kind of website and email. I bet you Steve got most of the questions here during the class, but if you've got something you need to ask, you can always reach out to email us. I've got great information always on our website. You can get the handout there if you need to, um, or if you're not tired of listening to me, the recording will be posted on there here pretty quick as well. So just one second, I'll stop my sharing. I think I might have just made it. Look at that, I got one minute to spare here, Nicole. So just as a reminder, you know, with the classes we always have here, 20% off all the vines. That starts today, goes all the way through next Friday. You know, we're in prime springtime here. We got a bunch of vines delivered the last couple of weeks. So whether it's the grape, the kiwi, you want something flowering, we pretty much got everything in that I mentioned. A couple of things we're still waiting for, but we would have something down, I'm sure, that would catch your fancy for your particular garden. 20% off all those for the week. Um, the next class is here. You know, it's Mother's Day time. Happy early Mother's Day to all the moms out there, including my mom, if she's watching. We got a couple weeks till Mother's Day. If you know the nursery business, this is our crescendo to the season every year in May. So we are super busy here this week. Today is a madhouse with the sun for the next three weeks into June. So we do take a couple weeks away. You won't hear me blabbling here for three weeks or so on classes. We're back. Uh, May 21st will be the next class after today. Uh, we're doing thrillers, fillers, and spillers, which is kind of a fun way that we design container gardens, hanging baskets, 
I'll have some guests in here with me and we'll be having some fun doing some container plantings and talking about a lot of annuals and some permanent things that we can add into our containers as well. That class will be sponsored by Ever Clinic. Dr. Lola's over here staring at me saying, why can't I be in this week? But she'll be back in May. So if you're local here, you remember, I think that's a great deal with Ever Clinic. They sponsor one of our classes a month. We don't take the money. I'm not getting rich. Sunnyside's not getting rich off this. Basically, they're buying five $50 gift cards that Nicole and I get to kind of delve out to, to five lucky customers around here. So they can come down and buy some thrillers, fillers, and spillers and make your containers pop here for the summer. So that's coming up the 21st. The next week after that, we kind of get back into the, the gardening hardcore classes with me. So the 28th hydrangea class, first one of the year. 29th is the rose class. That's perfect timing for roses as we head into summer. We have a great selection of roses and all of ours will be blooming. So I'll probably have a bunch of blooming roses in behind me and I'll be overcome by fragrance for the, the 29th class, all right? So let's see, do we got any questions left, Nicole? So you were talking about the next time we're back, May 21st. What else is happening on that day? Super exciting is we're doing our free uh, container planting event that we do every year. So we will provide the soil, free organic soil from E.B. Stone to fill your containers and the hands to, to get dirty and to plant. So all you got to do, buy a container with us. They're 50% off. Get your plants here. You can even bring one of your containers that you've got at home. Buy the plants with us and we will plant them up and load them in your car for you. Make it nice and easy so that you've got instant ready to go color that you can just plop on your porch and be done with it. So we're doing well, that the 21st too here in house. So that's really exciting. We love that event every year too. Yeah. Well, and I would add to this is, is think of it this way, because I'm glad you brought it up. Because I think it's a great service that we do here. EB Stone's been very supportive of us, giving us some potting soil to use. It's the best soil to plant all this stuff. Is I It makes me chuckle because I hear up here on the radio, you know, two weeks ago, Fred Meyer was doing free container day and this place and that place. It's way too early for that stuff. If you went and planted your fuchsias the first week in April at the free Fred Meyer day, you're probably going to reflect we're planting them again here pretty quick because we've been too cold, uh, too wet, too cold for a lot of the annual stuff. So, you know, you can get started in May. I'm not saying that. I think we're warm enough now. You can have at most of the annuals, but that weekend in May, I think is perfect. If you're going to time Sweet, I can get all my containers prepped and all my color schemes figured out, bring them down because that's a great day to take advantage of free help from us and of course free soil uh, for the containers as well. Yeah, I forgot about the hanging baskets too. We're happy to do those and yep. you guys are gonna kind of roll that into the class on the 21st too, yep. right? Yep. Yep. Yeah, really exciting stuff. I, I love, you know, getting all my plants and having somebody else plant them for me. I mean, I love it, but there's always a lot of work in the yard, right? So anything you can get a little bit of help on sometimes is nice. Just take it home and hang it or take it yeah, home right. and put it on the porch. <laughs> You're done. Right. There you go. <laughs> um, so I found it really interesting that a lot of these vines you mentioned are good for ground covers. Yeah. I didn't even think about that. That's a really yeah. great way to just cover a big, you know, massive yeah. area. Not even, I mean, smart. Love that. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I like going vertical, but that's an option with a lot of them is they'll turn into ground covers. The climbing head drainage, you can do clematis like that. I mean, a lot of the vines... If you don't support them, that's what they're going to do is flop and start sprawling out and covering some covering some real estate. Yeah. So speaking of going vertical, growing them like in a tree, you know, yep. as that support, yep. that is such a cool idea. Are there yep. things we need to keep in mind? Like, does the tree need to be a certain year old or certain level of establishment yep. for them to kind well, of coexist? Well, I, I would I, I wouldn't do it on a young tree because we want some support. So this would be probably for something a little bit more mature. It doesn't need to be 50 feet tall by any means. Um, but it, you know, again, could make your choice wisely. You know, I mentioned here, Steve planted that, you know, evergreen evergreen hydrangea that actually roots right into the cherry bark. Um, it's, a, it's a really interesting, you know, idea and texture as you look at it grow. It's like, wow, that's really cool. It's climbing up into that tree 20 feet by now. You know, that's something that would root right into the bark. Other things will find their way, you know, and loop around branches and hang here. You know, for me, you know, I ran a, a nursery whites for 20 years, many moons ago. And one of my employees, I would go to her house every single May and June to go look at her clematis because she lived in Bothell at 60, 80 foot Douglas firs around her entire garden. And every single one of them had clematis planted at the base 
tied up to get up the trunk. And then they sat there and limbed out through all the limbs of the evergreens. And yes, you didn't see the whole thing because it is a conifer, but you looked up and you're like, holy smokes, it looks like that Douglas fir is blooming white, you know, because she had selected large growing clematis that would give her the effect she wanted. And they're absolutely stunning in the yard when you got an old tree like that. So most all the vines you could do that with, just be careful, you know, some things, maybe you don't want it rooting right into your bark. Other things, if we give it some room to try, it'll find its way and, and, and the tree will support itself. So that's really cool. So any tree is basically, I mean, are there any we should be leery I, of? Or? Well, you know, probably, you know, I would get something larger if it was me, you know, big flowering trees. You know, again, maybe it's, a, you know, it's a perfect example to me as, as the cherry, you know, it blooms in spring and then it's just there. So what can I put on it that, so, wow, that looks really cool in the summer and fall. So maybe I choose a different season. You know, if it's a crab apple tree, maybe I don't get a spring blooming vine, but I get something that blooms in summer. So I add another flower season to it, you know, kind of deal. Um, I'd probably avoid, you know, maybe the Japanese maple side of this, just me maybe being a maple guy, because I just think it's not a huge plant anyway. Certainly there are some larger ones you could do it with, but, you know, big flowering trees, big shade trees, conifers, things that we can get light into that have some gaps in the branching that will, that will allow it to develop. Really cool. Love that idea. <laughs> um, so we talk a lot about, say you moved into a house and you inherited something, right? Yeah. You were mentioning like wisteria, certain places you want to make sure that it's not planted or, you know, a yeah. trumpet vine that just will take over. What if you inherit yeah. something like that? Is there anything you can do when you should move it or, you know, pruning well, it, it to help it? it? What do you do? Well, always moving is going to be in the dormant season. So if I'm going to try to dig something up and relocate it, I, I would recommend not doing that here until we get it dormant next winter again. So you got probably, you know, mid-November, early December to first of March, you know, kind of time frame uh, for transplanting. Yes, these things can get cut back substantially to try to control the size. But on some you mentioned, you know, and I'm not going to pick on any vine, but take the wisteria and the trumpet vine that you mentioned. You know, sometimes it's not about the above ground, it's about the root system. And, you know, you can't control the root system. You know, and wisteria will suffer a little bit. Campsus vine absolutely will suffer a little bit. So, you know, if that's the concern, then maybe it needs to be removed and we get a different plant in there that may be more to your liking, you know, if you inherited it. If you've got the room, they're spectacular. You know, I, it's just maybe to me, you know, I don't know that I'd put a wisteria I mentioned earlier, right next to my front door and try to train it over the, the entrance. You know, I'm gonna probably have too big of a plant at some point. And the, the worst thing to me with all plants, including vines is you get a nice specimen, you plant it, it matures for four, five, six, seven years. You're like, yes, that is exactly what I wanted. I've got my arbor covered. I got flowers every year. And then two years go by after that. And you're like, well, well wait a minute, stop. Because I can't, just press a button and say, stop. I mean, vine is a vine. It's going to want to grow and grow and grow. So yes, I can prune it back and let it regrow. That's what we do with our large wisteria here to keep it contained. But again, choose your spot wisely. I would have big post, big structure, something very sturdy to grow something like that on so that I never have to worry about messing or removing it down the road. Gotcha. That was going to be my next question about pruning some of these, you know, yeah. more vigorous growers. You know, we talk about the one third rule a lot with like shrubs yeah. and stuff. Does, can you pretty hard prune them back and, you know, oh, yeah, yeah. To control so again, them? depending on the vine, you know, we've talked about things specifically do the during the class, but, you know, I can always cut a clematis back, you know, it's going to grow. It's not going to kill it, you know, but if I cut it back too hard and I have an old wood bloomer, I got no flowers that year. So that's something to keep in mind. You know, honeysuckle just blooms on old wood. So I'm not gonna cut, you know, a third's fine, but I'm probably not gonna go to the ground. Yes, it'll shoot up and probably grow again, but I'm gonna have no flower power for that season. Um, you know, other things, again, with the wisteria, you know, it's very easy, you know, they'll send out tendrils probably six or eight feet on a good growing season. It's really easy to go in there and get rid of all that worthless thin wood anyway and go back to my main branches and structure, off we go again next year. You know, that's what we do here at the nursery. 
Cool. Um, last question. What about if you've already got one, got vines or one that's established, what, what are some good like yearly care tips, like fresh yeah. compost around it, food, yep. what do you do? Yeah, that's a, that's a great, great thing kind of on the average. And well, let's just do it this way. All of them are, would, would have really appreciate some food. We always feed our kids. We got to feed our plants too. So absolutely fertilizer. And it's not, you know, I would not go out and pump you know, seed grow, miracle grow, whatever your water soluble is. I'm not interested in that every other week. On the annual vines, yes, you know, we'll keep that as kind of a separate deal because I want flower power for the season. But a hardy, woody plant I'm keeping in, if I walk out, you know, in that first of March time frame and I apply rose and flower food from EB Stone, a nice granular organic, and I go back and do it maybe once more, late May, early June, that's plenty to, to keep my vine happy. Yes, I would mulch it. Yes, I would always put compost on top of my fertilizer or scratch it in really well. I'm not going to bury up the stem, you know, on a lot of these plants. Clematis I can, if you remember us talking about those. But the other things, I'm not going to change the soil level, but I could absolutely mulch uh, to help my watering needs. And then again, keep those plants happy through the season. So we would want to add some food maybe now before they start or yeah, when they start blooming? Yeah, if you, ha if you haven't done it yet, certainly it's not late, too late ever. So put some food down here right away and then maybe again go back in that mid-late June time frame with the second dose. I've got a happy plant through the season from there. You know, Love if you're going to, if you know, she mentioned pruning. If you're going to prune something back, you know, again, it, it's not that it's too late right now to prune. You can still get up there and do a little bit of tidying. But this is something I would try to do before we get into springtime. So typically I'm out, you heard me bring up my clematis. I went out and checked it out and said, yep, all that old wood got wilt. Oh, here we go with fresh stuff out of the ground. I cut all that old wood off, untied it off my trellis, put it in the yard waste, and here we go. I'm starting off for a year. I've already grown two feet, you know, in the last two weeks as it comes up already. Wisteria, always get in there and remove. It could be any time. You could do it in the summer if you wanted. You could do it in the wintertime when you can see a little easier. But I can always get in and thin it out, cut some of those long tendrils back. And as long as I leave that old mature wood, the majority of it, that's where I'm going to drop my huge flowers from anyway. Cool. I feel uh, energized to go, A, because I got a shopping list, things I got to go check go. out. <laughs> and B, take care of the ones I have in my yard. Super exciting. Um, yep. Thanks for joining us. As always, a lot of information. So don't be shy to you know catch the recording later today. Go back, pause, write, screenshot, whatever you need. Um, and reach out. We're happy to talk about plants. Hopefully you're local and we get a chance to see you. It's always fun for us to see who's on the other side of the screen. You know, Give us a wave as you're in the nursery yard. Tell us that you know, you're one of the people that we're talking to that we can't see. Um, um, hopefully someday soon we'll be back live in person. Um, but until then, we really appreciate you spending your day with us. And uh, we'll hope to see you in a few weeks back on the 21st, both online for the class and then hopefully in-house for the container planting day too. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks everybody for joining us. 67 degrees today. I'm not sure what we're going to do around here, but come on down. The sun is shining. The place looks beautiful. Enjoy the day. <laughs>